Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is the final round game from the 2013 U.S. Chess Championship, which was held at the St. Louis Chess Club and Scholastic Center. It's the game between Gatakamski and Alejandro Ramirez. These were the two players who were tied after nine rounds of classical play, and so a two-round rapid playoff was needed with 25-minute time controls. Both of those games were drawn, which meant a third and, again, final round was needed to determine who would earn the title of U.S. champion and walk away with $30,000. Now, this game was of an Armageddon format, which meant if you were playing with the black pieces and you ended up drawing, you were declared the winner. Now, how exactly that was determined was by having both players prior to the game, of course, write down a number in an envelope, and that number represented the amount of time that they were willing to begin the game with to have the black pieces. And whoever chose the lower number would be granted the black pieces, whereas the other player would start the game with 45 minutes. So before the game, Kamski ended up choosing 20 minutes, and Ramirez ended up choosing 19 minutes, 45 seconds. So Ramirez won out. He picked the lower amount of time. He began with the black pieces. He started with 19 minutes, 45 seconds. Kamski began this game on the white end with 45 minutes. There was a five-second increment, and this is how it took shape. Kamski opened with d4, and this is actually the direction in game one of the playoffs. We saw this same variation take shape. Both sides fiend kettling. And we have the C pawn contributing to control in the center. Queen C7, Knight A3, and now a variant of that first game's playoff, Knight D to B5 hitting the queen, and she just drops back right away. Bishop G5 getting more development in, Knight C6, Queen D2. There might be some ideas of getting rid of the dark square bishop. This knight is eventually kicked, but notice the weakness it leaves behind. That could prove... Uh, to be a, a stepping point for the white pieces later on, especially in anticipation of a very common idea. If you have this c4 move in, a knight posting up on d5 will be eyeing that square, and we will be seeing that soon enough. But first, development on the black end, provoking e4. e4 is played, okay, white grabs some more space, but at least the bishop isn't seeing as clearly along that long diagonal. So it drops back, still keeping a close eye on d5. Knight jumps in, and we have this knight repositioning, eyeing both e5 and c5. Rook gets involved. Black rook gets involved. b3, just keeping everything nice and tight, watching over c4. Black's other rook gets involved on e8, and now h3. And when we look at this position here, some things to note is that, of course, we have white with a space advantage, these two pawns. This knight firmly in black's position, and White would absolutely love to just have this knight captured because what it means is that white will secure a pawn in black's territory and rob the black pieces of a, a very important square, c6. I don't know that there's a better home for this knight on c6 as it stands right now. So just small improvements here. h3, a common idea. An additional square now for the king later on. Knight e5. And now king to h1. There is maybe... Um, the temptation to play to h2, but one idea is that maybe this move is available. I'm not saying that it's uh, the greatest move in the world, but just note that it couldn't be captured because of these knight moves with check. So this is just a prophylactic move, getting this king off of this diagonal. That's the main idea here. And when you have the option of h2 or h1, we have uh, Kamsky going for h1 to rule out any tricky stuff with the knights landing on f3 or g4. So a lot of back and forth moves for black because it's tough to really suggest something right here. How do you make improvements for the black side? Where is black's pawn break? It comes in the form of maybe b5. There's certainly not going to be any d5 break, so this is the only break to really look into. But as it stands right now, it's quite difficult to get in. You're not even threatening b5 at this point because after a couple captures, this file right here, the C file, is opened up. The knight would have pressure on it, and this knight is unstable. Could be kicked with F4. Black would be uh, losing a piece on C6. 
So rook to b8 for the moment is not threatening anything. It's not facilitating b5 at the moment. Repositioning, this was the worst place piece on a3, so knight c2. Queen to d7, eyes that h3 square. Knight b6, making use of that hole, the queen drops back. Bishop e3, keeps a watchful eye in the knight. Knight d7, what do you do about the knight being challenged here? You avoid that exchange. If this knight is going to be captured, white wants to be able to recapture and grab some space. Grab some more squares from the black pieces c6 and e6 in particular so that's why we have this exchange of knights being avoided knight comes back to d5 knight c5 and now here we go with f4 this was it should have been absolutely no surprise to black and because we have these prophylactic moves h3 king h1 you're doing that so you could get this f pawn working so that you're off of this diagonal so these pawns get rolling and black finally lashes out Grab some space on the queen side, frees up the position a little bit. C takes B, A takes B, and now here we go with F5, pressing forward, grabbing some space on the king side, hitting the bishop. Bishop for knight exchange. Notice that there is a drawback, however. E5 is now a pivot point for the black knight. We do see that. After E takes D, we have knight E5, and then knight to B4. This seems like a very strong post for the knight. Watches over this pawn, stops this guy from moving, has a jumping point on c6, and it also watches over d3 so that there's no knight pivot, no black knight pivoting on d3. Queen a5. And there is the potential to maybe have a queen exchange, and keep in mind, this is, again, an Armageddon, so black needs only to draw the game to be declared the winner. And so... That weighs in a great deal, of course, because if you enter in certain positions where maybe there is opposite color bishops, that maybe starts to tip in black's favor. So from here, we have this exchange going on. White is actually netting a pawn, and we have now the follow-up of rook to c8. Keep in mind, we do still have the potential for opposite color bishops with the dark square bishop for black, light square for white. Rook to c8 was the move that was played here, but an interesting alternative would have been knight to d3, exploiting this pin. After that bishop had captured on c5, this queen on d2 is now unprotected. And so a move like knight to d3 is available, forking these two pieces. And after, let's say, queen takes, queen takes knight, I think we're approaching, okay, black is down a pawn, but again, I think black is much closer to obtaining a good version of a good versus, or not a good versus bad bishop, but opposite color bishop type of position. This queen, uh, I think, is very strongly placed. Pressure on the rook. Maybe watching over e7 as soon as the rook moves. And then maybe look to play this rook to c8 move or maybe rook to d8 move. This, however, was not the move played. And the knights still do get exchanged in this game. But what we're going to, what we're going to see is that it happens under much different circumstances. Let's see how exactly. First, rook to c8. A pair of rooks come off. These pawns are exchanged, the f-file is ripped open, so f7 becomes a sensitive point, and uh, immediate pressure is placed on it right away. It is defended by the knight, but of course this knight can now be challenged. White is positioning themselves so that this knight could try to look to deflect it in some way. Knight d3 stuff, not saying that that's best. Knight c6 would be the ideal square, and soon enough we'll see him jumping in there. So, uh, queen c7, opposite the queen indirectly. And now a4, this pawn gets rolling. It is now a, it's a runner, it's a passed pawn. f5, a very committal move, and it does weaken this diagonal. Uh, subject itself, the king subjects itself to maybe some checks along that long diagonal. And now the knight does jump into c6, and now we have the knights being exchanged. And this is the situation I'm talking about, because now, after the recapture, we have a great transformation. What do we have? Instead of a white d pawn, it's a big deal being that it's now on the C file because it's now passed and just a couple steps away from queening. So it's a great change that we just saw right there, that capture right there earlier again, that move jumping into D3, having the knights come off, but to still have it so that this pawn, this, there is not a white pawn that is passed, makes a much bigger difference. Um, but we have now this very simplified endgame with now e5, black is starting to go 
wrong because, well, I don't know that there is a great solution at this point. There are two pass pawns with still the major pieces on the board. It's uh, still very, very difficult to come away with the draw here for black. So what black would love to do is slam the door on the bishop, but that's not going to be allowed. First, we have this check thrown in on d5. The king scoots over is opposite this uh, rook right now, and white immediately challenges it with g4. And after a couple exchanges, we have white now being up a couple pawns in this opposite color bishop ending. King getting more central, watching uh, over the c7 square. Bishop backs up. The rook is putting pressure on the a pawn. Counterattack on the bishop. E4, primary reason. This bishop just wants to be able to breathe for the longest time. Well, not for the longest time, but for just for that moment. It was watching over the pawn. It wants to have some more freedom of movement. It wants to maybe be able to pivot on E5 to watch over the advancement of this past C pawn. So another pawn is given up. It's now three. Three pawn advantage for black. Bishop E5 getting central. We have a check thrown in. Bishop drops back and... Note how at this point right here, we had king to b6 played. If rook takes pawn is played, this pawn can march on. And if it is captured, we would end up with this fork. The bishop's dead, and soon thereafter the king will be. So we don't have that. We don't have rook takes pawn, but rather king b6. The rook challenges the bishop, and now black works themselves into a pin. If this bishop ever moves, the exchange of rooks at this point right here will be winning for white. These pawns are just too much to deal with. So... What is tried after h4 is played this pawn? It's very clear plan for Kamsky at this point just to push this h pawn forward. So black needs to do what exactly? The attempt that's tried is to have the king now come over to watch over the bishop, which would free up this rook to move. So we have after h4, king c7, h5, king d6, h6. And now rook takes a4. What do you do here for white? This is the killer move. Rook takes bishop. There's no good solution at this point. After king takes rook, c7, no good solution here. This pawn is ready to queen. This pawn not far off. And it is at this point that Ramirez ends up resigning. There is nothing to do here. After rook to c4, we would have h7. This pawn promotes. That's game over. So as it stood in this game, we had after c7, again, Ramirez resigning. <clears throat> and Kamsky going on to win what's now his fourth U.S. championship, but hats off still to uh, Ramirez. I, I, I believe he had a fantastic tournament, and uh, it really was tight all the way in the playoff, in the classical play. Uh, hats off to both players, and uh, again, congratulations to Kamsky on his fourth win. So that's all for this video. As always, I hope you got something out of it. Take care. Bye.